order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning. I have to tell members that questions 5 and 10 have been withdrawn, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Mr Stephen Mutry. Mr uh, Mutry. Question 1, Deputy Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Steps to Success is my department's main programme for assisting unemployed and economically inactive people to find and sustain employment. Contracts were awarded on 8 July 2014, and the programme became operational on 20 October. The three organisations awarded the contracts were INGIUS in the Greater Belfast and surrounding area, Reed in Partnership in the, in the South and South West, and EOS NI in the North and North West. Each organisation has a local supply chain partners to provide full geographical coverage and special support for all participants. The delivery organisations work with each participant to identify their individual barriers to finding work and they agree a progression to employment plan. This plan will outline actions to be taken by both the participant and contractor. The actions can include job search activity, vocational training, confidence building, preparation of CVs, assistance with health related issues and short work placements. The progression to employment plan will be updated on a regular basis to take account of, of, of improvements in the, the participants' employability and actions for the future. Contractors also work with local, small, medium and large employers to identify job vacancies for job-ready participants. The level of service delivered to each participant is underwritten by a service guarantee that defines the minimum level of service they receive. The Department has contract management and quality improvement teams that are already monitoring to ensure a high quality service is delivered to all. Each con contractor has into and sustained work targets that are higher than outcomes attained in steps to work. By the 20th of February, over 13,500 people have started on the programme. Independently verified information on the programme performance will be available from the autumn 2016 onwards once participants have completed the programme and job sustainment can be measured. Mr Mutry for supplementary. Thank you and I thank the Minister uh, for his response. Can I ask the Minister, is he aware of the percentage of people who don't complete the programme for whatever reason and is there a penalty for failure to complete the programme? Uh, well, at this stage, it would be um, early, too early to have an indication of those um, who don't complete uh, the programme. And of course, there can be benign reasons for not completing the programme and someone is moving into work. On the other hand, there may well be a situation uh, for those who go through the programme uh, without uh, pro progressing in, in, into work. The, the programme is moving more towards incentives. It's not as, as heavily focused upon out, uh, formal job out, 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 out placements that, uh, um, compared to the comparative programme in Great Britain, but it's a combination of job attachment and just, uh, sustained employment out, out, outcomes that will measure, measure success in this regard. I think that's the best way of going. This reflects, again, local design of the programme to reflect the circumstances in Northern Ireland. Mr. Fran McCann for supplement. Uh, uh, last Frank, call you. Uh, can the Minister tell me, there, there has been concerns about the, the previous scheme and about this scheme and how it will work and the jobs it will provide. Can the Minister uh, give us an assurance that it will be heavily monitored and that if there are problems that the department will move right away to ensure that uh, things are fixed? Uh, very much so. One of the, the key aspects of the new programme is a service uh, guarantee. And it's worth making um, reference to the work programme in, in Great Britain, where, what the, where they have what's termed a black box. So once someone is, moves in uh, to the work programme, uh, they're effectively out of sight, out of mind in terms of the, uh, of the interaction uh, with the state. That's not the case in Northern Ireland. Again, that's why, uh, because of the, our local circumstances and because of, of the opportunities of devolution, uh, we did things differently. So the service guarantee is there to, to ensure that there are minimum standards and also that there's, there's no temptation for contractors to work with those um, clients they perceive that, that can be more readily moved into work, that every person coming forward will have an individually tailored package that, that addresses the, their needs. Of course, the members also rightly identifying that we need to be investing more in, in job creation. Uh, th that is at the heart of everything the executive is, is, tra is trying to do, and uh, we need to ensure that we have a steady stream of people coming through a whole range of different skill levels um, in, into our labour market uh, in order to take advantage of, of, of jobs that, that are being created. There are inefficiencies within our labour market. Those are long-term and structural, and programmes such as, as, as this are vital in terms of trying to, to, to actually address that, uh, that vicious circle. We've experienced in the past. Mr. Pat Ramsey for supplement. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Separate to the Steps to Success training schemes, most worrying in the month of February would see the end of any young 
person joining youth employment schemes. Could the Minister outline to the House what is going to replace that to ensure that young people in particular have an opportunity on training? Uh, well, the member is quite right to, to continue to focus on uh, youth unemployment, and while um, our youth unemployment figures um, are improving in Northern Ireland, um, and we have seen a, a fairly significant move in, in recent uh, months in, in that regard, they are still uh, a significant challenge, uh, though of course not on the same scale as, as we are experiencing uh, in other parts um, of, of Europe. Um, the youth employment scheme has been successful, however that was funded through a dedicated funding stream that the executive authorised uh, in uh, the spring of 2012, which is coming to its natural end uh, in, in March 2015. Other things being equal in terms of resources being available, uh, we would have liked to have bid uh, for that uh, scheme to, to continue, but sadly that has not been the case. However, we are looking to see what elements of the youth employment scheme can be mainstreamed through our, our frontline employment service offer. Uh, so we, we are looking to see within existing resources how far we can go to continuing aspects of that youth employment scheme. I am happy to keep the member informed of any further developments in that regard over the coming weeks. Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. But is the Minister aware of any concerns raised by course participants who are reporting concern in regard to the amount of expenses being paid out? Well, like with steps to work on indeed any other scheme, we, we do receive correspondence from participants um, who, who will raise issues in terms of the, the delivery of schemes. I mean, that is why we do place strong focus upon continued monitoring. We do not simply hand out contracts to, to organisations and then say, off you go and, and, and address this. The state has a, a fundamental interest in ensuring that these schemes are delivered uh, correctly uh, and in line with our overarching uh, policy uh, objectives. And where we believe that there are situations where uh, rules have been interpreted incorrectly or we are seeing uh, unjust uh, outcomes or, or, or situations emerging, yes, we will make representations in, in that regard. Um, I, I do not want to comment on the particular case the member has, has raised, but if he wants to get in touch with me directly, um, or, um, I will be happy to, to investigate that rather than comment uh, on something in the floor of the, of the, of the House without the, the full background to the case he mentions. Mr. Barney Michael Duff for a question. Uh, question number two. Uh, my officials work closely with employers and actively pursue opportunities to, facil to facilitate job fairs, employer breakfast events, to promote the services of my department, and recruitment events for individual employers across Northern Ireland. Bringing job fair events into local communities has proven to be a very successful means of assisting people back into work. When planning to host a job fair, my department carefully considers the number of job opportunities employers, um, uh, uh, that employers have made available in the, any particular location and establishes whether there is sufficient interest and demand from local companies to participate. My officials are extremely proactive in the OBA area and I am aware that they are currently working with Primark to host a customised recruitment event uh, during April this year for a new store which is due to open in, in the town centre in September. This is good news for job seekers in that area. Should the opportunity arise during this year uh, for, uh, based upon sufficient demand from, for, uh, from employers to, particip to participate in a job fair in the Oma area, my officials are available to organise and facilitate any such event. Mr. Mingham, Duff for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer and welcome the commitment that his people based in Oma are working with Primark in, in the matter he described. Uh, can I just say to the Minister that recently there was a detailed list of locations where the Department has held jobs fairs in 2014 and no locations in either Tyrone or Fermanagh were mentioned. I would point out or I would ask the Minister um, if he can work with the Deputy Minister to create opportunities for highly qualified and skilled graduates in West Tyrone who are unable to secure employment locally at this time. Um, well, I am very mindful of the, the issue of uh, 
regional opportunities, and the member will, will be aware that the executive have set up um, a subcommittee to look at, at regional issues. Now, that was sparked um, primarily by issues in the northwest, and I know, depending on how you define the northwest, you can include, inc potentially include OMA in that regard. But that um, working group isn't just primarily, isn't exclusively focused on the northwest. It's also looking at other aspects of balance uh, acro across Northern Ireland. Of course, we are very keen to work uh, as an executive as a whole, but uh, particularly um, myself with the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment to ensure that we are creating uh, job op opportunities uh, anywhere we can. And certainly my, my officials stand ready to work with companies to address their, their skill needs. And the member will also be aware that uh, with uh, South West College there is a huge resource in the, in the local community uh, that is there to interact directly with businesses and to ensure that we are bringing forward young people and indeed people of, of other ages uh, with the skills that are relevant to, to employers in the community. Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware that there was a jobs fair in Limavady, uh, hosted by the North West Regional College, which I alluded to at last question time. Uh, as a person who was asked to go along and help launch it as the MP for the area, it looked to me as if it was outstandingly successful, given the numbers that were there. But can the Minister indicate what, after analysis is done, post the event to ensure that future events are equally as successful and can be built on in the future? I'm almost tempted to say that probably the event was so successful because they knew that the member was actually due to, to attend in his capacity as, 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 as MP. Um, uh, but uh, I'm sure there's a few others came along for other reasons as well, apart, apart from that. Um, yes, the, the feedback we, were, we, we do seek feedback from, from these events, both from participants and also from the, the employers, because we have to have a process of continual learning uh, in, in this regard. The feedback we have received to date from, from both aspects has been very positive about the, these events and uh, we're more than happy uh, uh, whether we're talking about um, uh, Tyrone for Manor, whether we're talking about uh, County Londonderry uh, to consider further uh, such events based upon a critical mass of, of demand emerging uh, fr from employers. Um, our, our staff will be very proactive in, in engaging with employers to try to create th those opportunities. We're not sitting here in a passive way waiting for people to come knock on our door. We'll be out working uh, with employers to see if the opportunities arise. But yes, there's a very strong focus upon that. Learned. Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister as well for his answer. Uh, given the number of job fairs that are planned, could the Minister give us an indication as to a the quantity and picking up on Mr. McElduff's point, b the location of those for 2015, please? Well, at this stage, we don't have a, a, def a definitive list um, in terms of numbers or indeed uh, locations for job fairs. But what I would say to the member and indeed uh, others, I mean, this is not something that we're, we're seeking, seeking to ration. Um, th this is something that is a good thing to do because what we're here to do is to shift people uh, in, into employment, to meet the needs of those who are unemployed, and also to address uh, the requirements of employers to, to fill uh, vacancies or uh, to actually create jobs um, where, where maybe an employer hasn't yet even identified a vacancy. But but uh, maybe encouraged to take someone on to, to increase their productivity. So as and when we see the opportunity arising in different parts of Northern Ireland, then we will, we will take the, up those opportunities. It is almost certain that we will have um, major events in both Belfast and Derry once again, given that we have had very successful events um, in the past 12 months in both of those uh, locations. But we are open uh, to working in any part of Northern Ireland where the demand is, is identified where, in, in terms of critical mass to make such an event uh, sustainable. Mr. Mike Nesbitt for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question three. The consultation identified a number of critical issues, uh, in particular uh, a general acceptance that exclusivity clauses are not appropriate in the majority of employment contracts. There is also a need for a clear, unambiguous legal definition of zero hours and other non guaranteed hours contracts. Although the appropriate use of these contracts can contribute to labour market flexibility, it is clear that they can have an adverse impact on vulnerable workers, particularly in accessing benefits and credit. The increasing casualisation of the labour market requires a proportionate response to protect the rights of workers. The consultation feedback indicated difficulties experienced by workers in accessing benefits and a desire by many for a move to fixed contracts. In response, I intend using uh, the, the, my department's employ forthcoming employment bill, which is being drafted, to establish a clear, unambiguous definition of zero hours and non guaranteed hours contracts and to, pro to prohibit the use of exclusivity clauses. 
A total ban could be readily circumvented, so I intend to include enabling provisions to allow for the introduction of an anti-avoidance and enforcement measures. Enabling powers will also establish a right for workers to request a fixed hours contract after a specified period, which an employer will only be able to refuse on objective business grounds. Conscious that many vulnerable workers may not feel comfortable in exercising this right, I propose to include additional provisions that will require an employer to review and justify the continuance of a zero hours contract after a specified period. I also propose establishing a statutory code of practice that will, that will bring much needed clarity in terms of employers' obligations and workers' rights. Finally, I have written to the Minister of Social Development to secure his support for a joint departmental project to develop more responsive processes that will assist vulnerable workers in accessing their, their benefit entitlements. Mr Nesbitt for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister. If I understand correctly, he's ruling out an outright ban on the use of zero hours contracts. How does he square that with uh, the Executive's desire to build a high tech, high wage economy where employees have their rights protected? Well, let me be very clear at the outset. Um, I'm not here to, to justify uh, zero hours uh, contracts. I want to see a, an economy that's built, built around um, high-level skills uh, and is based around people having security and sustainability in terms of, of their work. However, we have to recognise uh, that we are seeing a, a casualisation of uh, the labour market, and there may well be some circumstances in which businesses wish to make uh, a case uh, for the continued use of uh, zero hours contracts. And while I'm very uh, alert to the demands from a lot of stakeholders and indeed members for an outright ban on zero hours contracts, we need to be very careful a, that we we don't go for a disproportionate uh, response to what is nonetheless a very clear and, and, and difficult uh, problem, but also inadvertently that we don't actually end up uh, putting people out of work, because we could see a situation where some unscrupulous employers, um, if they're forced to, to, to move people off zero hours contracts, for example, after a specified time into a permanent contract, will simply dismiss those, period, uh, th those workers, not least because they're in the, the, the qualifying period, um, but it's below the qualifying period for unfair dismissal, and uh, simply seek to hire other people or to rehire people uh, on a different contract. So we need to be careful that uh, we may, uh, an outright ban may actually not be, be effective. What we're proposing here is a proportionate response, which I believe goes a long way to addressing the needs of, of vulnerable workers, and actually a uh, in terms of our proposals, goes further than what is currently being legislated for uh, in terms of the UK Parliament with, with respect to Great Britain. To Phil Flanagan. I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Uh, the Minister has accepted that zero hour contracts have a, a negative impact on workers, um, but his proposals fall far short of what is required to protect and promote workers' rights. Um, and he says that a total ban could be easily circumvented. I don't agree with the fact that employers would find some way of continuing to exploit workers as a justification for not banning these things. So, can I ask the Minister um, to provide some evidence to, to justify his claim in a briefing document that a ban on zero hour contracts? would have a disproportionate impact upon flexibility within the economy and potentially remove some employment opportunities, because it's certainly not a statement that I would agree with. Well, the member is entitled to have his view and, indeed, his analysis. And, uh, indeed, um, in the event that the executive does clear um, proposals to allow um, clauses in zero hours contracts to, to be part of a forthcoming employment bill, the committee will have the opportunity to scrutinise and, and propose amendments, as indeed will members on the floor of, of the Assembly. So this is something where the House will find its, the natural level in terms of what they believe is appropriate uh, for, for, for Northern Ireland. However, we do need to be conscious of the fact that these contracts are being used by a number of businesses in Northern Ireland at present. Um, personally, am I seeking to justify that? No, no I am not. However, I do need to be mindful of the fact that if this House goes for a disproportionate response to the problem, then there is a risk that we, we inadvertently uh, force people out of, of, jo out of job opportunities. There may well be situations where employers can provide an objective justification uh, for uh, zero hours contracts, and that's why uh, we're, we're, we, we have created that potential um, uh, duty on employers to, to make the case um, why, why the, that, that has to be the case rather than simply casually um, going for that, that, that option. But th this type of, con of employment contract is not something that's unique to Northern Ireland. They're being used increasingly uh, in, in Great Britain, probably in, in a, on a higher level, uh, in greater numbers in Great Britain on a, on a per capita basis. They're used in other jurisdictions as well. It's important that we move with the times 
with, with regulation. And I'm fully aware of all the, the difficulties that TRR's contracts can pose to too many people. In some cases, people will choose them, uh, whether it, perhaps they're semi-retired or, or, or students. But in the vast bulk of cases, they are the only employment option that is open uh, to people, and there is a danger of, of explo exploitation. However, we need to be very careful that in, in seeking to address that uh, in a proportionate way, that we do not inadvertently create a situation where we cut off employment opportunities uh, within, within our economy, because employers are only prepared to contemplate uh, creating opportunities in the context where they have some degree of flexibility Ministers, over how often people work during, during the working week. Perhaps it is appropriate to suggest that I'm not particularly interested in hearing people's views during question times, only their questions. Yeah. Uh, can I call on Ms. Anna Lowe? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. While the Minister said he is not going to ban zero hour contract, he is said, uh, uh, he said he's going to ban the exclusive visiting clauses. Can I ask the Minister how he's going to implement and enforce it? Um, I thank the member uh, for her question. I assume, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that uh, that uh, dictate doesn't apply to me in terms of giving my opinion in terms of, in terms of answers. I was going to suggest the answers could be brief. Okay, the uh, <laughs> brief. I will be as comprehensive in a, in a short period of time as I can. The, 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 the issue in terms of, of enforcement uh, obviously lies through the, the tried and tested mechanisms that exist in terms of, uh, of, of tribunals, but also um, where the first step should always be uh, recourse to the Labour uh, Relations Agency and with a whole suite of different forms of alternative dispute uh, resolution techniques uh, that, 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 that are uh, available. Let me be also clear as well that I am seeking to facilitate legislation coming to the House. The decision of whether there is a ban or no ban will be for members to take collectively based upon uh, that legislation and whether any amendments come forward along those lines that can carry uh, majority support uh, in, in, in the House. Exclusivity is, is a clear problem where people, uh, if they are tied to one contract, are denied opportunities to, work, uh, to find work elsewhere. And that is seen as being a particularly unjust uh, situation. And that is a very clear-cut example uh, where we should take action. Call Mr. John McCallis. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I, I welcome the Minister's uh, response so far. Uh, has he any accurate information around the, the numbers on zero hour contract that are both either through choice or indeed through uh, necessity? And would he further agree with me probably the best way um, to eliminate zero hour contracts would be to build a well educated workforce and extend opportunities in a knowledge based economy? Uh, well, starting from, from his, his last point, in general, yes. Um, the more that we in, in invest in higher, in higher level skills, uh, then the nature of employment uh, in our society w will change uh, with that. However, we need to be very careful of, of uh, ending up in, in, in generalisations. While the bulk of, of zero hours contracts may well be in terms of the, the lower paid positions within our economy, and that's where we have very particular uh, dangers in terms of, of vulnerable workers. It's important to bear in mind that zero hours contracts are used in a whole range of different uh, scenarios, including uh, some uh, professional areas and some very highly skilled uh, areas uh, as well. And indeed, that may, may well make sense for those particular professions or indeed the professionals who are engaged in those situations. Again, it's another reason why we need to be a little bit careful in terms of going for a, a blanket, um, one-size-fits-all approach to trying to address uh, this particular issue. In terms of the, of the figures in ter, uh, for Northern Ireland, on the extrapolation from uh, the, the estimates across the UK, we would have an upper limit of around about 28,000 uh, in Northern Ireland. I imagine in practice the figure is less than that. We are having a little bit of difficulty in, in getting pre precise figures, in, in not, not least because there is no real agreed understanding of what is your large contract uh, would be, uh, and that's one of the, of the processes we want to try to bottom out in terms of any formal uh, legislative process. We are working with uh, different organisations, including the Office of National Statistics and Intertrade Ireland, to try to get a more accurate picture of the numbers in Northern Ireland uh, in advance of that. Call Mr. Sean Rogers for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. Okay. Um, funding is provided to community and voluntary sector groups to deliver the Community Family Support Programme, Collaboration and Innovation Fund and Local Employment Intermediary Service throughout Northern Ireland. These programmes were designed to implement the Executive's Pathway to Success strategy to support young people not in employment, education or training. Also, under the current round, funding is provided from the European Social Fund to 95 voluntary and community sector organisations. 
Mr. Rogers for supplementary. Could I thank the, the Minister for his answer? Minister, what effect has the learning gaps in the community of group accounts caused by, say, late payments from his department had on the, as he talked about, the European Social Fund application process? Well, I, I'm not sure that they would have. I mean, issues around payment in terms of the current process should not have had an impact in terms of the current um, application process. Um, we have addressed uh, at length the, the concerns that have been expressed by members in relation uh, to the current application process and taken action uh, based upon the representations uh, that, that we have uh, received. However, it is, it is important to bear in mind that the Department does seek to make payments uh, promptly. Uh, we do tend to, to, to work towards that, the, the standard 10-day uh, turnaround period, uh, which um, is, is, is advocated by Account NI in terms of, of payments. Um, however, it's important to bear in mind the context around which we have to, to, be, to be rigorous, um, around ensuring that we have proper paper trails to justify payments being made to organisations, particularly in terms of European money. And if we fail to operate within the, the rules and regulations coming down from the European Commission, then we will have interruptions uh, to the delivery of, of the programmes. And an interruption does not just affect the particular organisation uh, that may well have contributed to that situation, but can actually penalise everyone who is benefiting uh, from the, the European Social Fund. So it is important that we do go through the rigour of the process. I appreciate that it is hugely frustrating to organisations, and it is no doubt uh, frustrating to my officials, uh, who, despite maybe people's perceptions to the contrary, uh, do not actually like uh, having to, to be uh, bureaucrats around, around these issues. But if we do not, the damage that will be done in terms of groups accessing much needed resources will be much greater uh, than the, the difficulty there is in actually processing payments. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, a number of voluntary community organisations had their ESF applications rejected due to financial capability when they, in fact, were waiting payments from the department on their previous EFS round. Would the minister like to comment on that? And also, could he comment as well about a complaint that has now been made by the, the, to the European Commission for Maladministration and to the European Social Fund by the Department of Employment and Learning? Well, 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 first of all, um, a, a number of groups were rejected in relation to financial capability um, assessments. However, some of those uh, groups, um, because of the, due to the, the, the fresh opportunity to resubmit management accounts, uh, will go through a second financial capability assessment. That process uh, is currently uh, ongoing uh, as we speak, and hopefully will be concluded um, shortly. Uh, in relation to any um, complaints to, to the European Commission, obviously groups are entitled uh, to make complaints, whether it is directly to the managing authority within Dell uh, or, or uh, to, to the Commission. However, I am satisfied that what we have been doing as a department has been consistent uh, with the requirements from the European Commission. And it is important that members are aware that the nature of the current or the forthcoming round of European Social Fund is different from the, the, the outgoing European Social Fund in terms of the rules uh, around, around, uh, around money and, and access to, to, to money. And uh, it is important that we, we, we have that different approach in, in terms of, of rigour. So I understand that the groups may well feel aggrieved in terms of that the, a sense of the goalposts being moved, but it is the European Union's money and they are entitled to set, to set the rules. And and I welcome the fact that we have the, the access to, to draw that money down, um, but uh, in doing so, we do have to fulfil uh, the requirements of, of the fund. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, would the minister care to comment on the suspicion expressed by some of the groups who have drawn social fund money for many years and now suddenly are disappointed in their applications? That what really is going on is a budgetary pressure within the department whereby European social money, in increasing terms, has been siphoned off into education colleges and matters of that nature, starving these community and voluntary groups of the funds which hitherto they enjoyed. Well, the member is, is very good at uh, peddling suspicions uh, and uh, innuendo, um, but not very good at actually checking out the facts before uh, making uh, such comments um, directly. But let me be, be very clear. Uh, everything that the member has said is utterly incorrect. Time is up. I've just been beaten to it. And we move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. David Hilditch. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister give us an assessment of the Northern Ireland uh, Science Festival, in particular the STEM Master Class initiative he launched? Yes, uh, uh, the the, the, the Science Festival has been a, an outstanding uh, success. This is the first time we have had a Science Festival uh, in Northern Ireland. In terms of the number of people uh, who attended the events uh, over the 10-day uh, the the period, I think they have uh, far exceeded uh, the targets uh, that were set. Um, I think that is a real indication of the, the, the real um, level of organisation and commitment of the organisers. Uh, and I want to pay particular um, cr credit to Chris McCurry, the director um, of, of, the, of the festival. What this is fundamentally about is engaging um, with the people of Northern Ireland, including uh, young people, um, about the importance of, of science to our everyday lives, and also encouraging people to pursue careers in, in, in STEM. The two master classes that the member uh, refers were about crystallising the, the best practice in, in that regard, and uh, we were very pleased that we had a number of visitors from the, from the United States. Um, uh, Dr. Von Spicer from the Boston Science Museum and uh, Dr. Sue Songerath from uh, Worcester Polytechnic uh, Institute in, in Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, th that uh, aspect was facilitated as well by the US State Department, uh, who were also were very keen to see how we are getting on uh, with the Science Festival. Um, as the members will know, the, the department uh, was a major funder uh, of the Science Festival. And uh, after we do an evaluation uh, of the event, and I have said to the member how pleased we were with the level of participants. Uh, we will look forward again to uh, potentially funding uh, the, the second science festival uh, in 2016 and see it uh, become a, an established part of the calendar of events in Northern Ireland. Mr. Hildage, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and welcome the Minister's answer. Uh, STEM is a, is a major theme in the, in the science festival. Uh, I do understand there seems to be an underrepresentation of females. Uh, how can uh, more representation and encouragement be given to females to participate? Yes, well, the member is quite right to identify this as being a, a particular um, challenge that uh, faces not just uh, Northern Ireland society but many other av advanced economies. Uh, we do see a situation uh, where girls and, uh, and women are pro progressing um, better in education, generally speaking, than boys and men at, at, at this stage. Um, for example, in, in higher education, we have a higher participation rate uh, from women uh, than from men. However, we're seeing a segmentation in the types of subjects that people are, are choosing. And as we look to the future and see, for example, um, IT, advanced en manufacturing, engineering, food science being some of the high growth sectors in Northern Ireland, it's important that we are drawing uh, as fully as possible. Uh, from the, ta the talent base that we have in Northern Ireland, unless we're drawing fully from that and across both genders, then we're not going to maximise uh, our full potential. In terms of how we address this problem, um, we need to break down the stereotypes around uh, a lot of the, 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 the STEM subjects. I think that's probably the, 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 the critical issue. There's work that we can also do around uh, working with employers, and I'm pleased to see that uh, with uh, NACO uh, signing up uh, last Friday to the, uh, to, to the STEM charter, that we have a lot of businesses who are seeking uh, very uh, overtly to address um, gender issues in terms um, of their, their employment, particularly around, around STEM, and to try to see how they can do better in terms of attracting more female staff and also working through retention and progression within the workplace. Call Mr. Trevor Clark for a topical question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, um, could he give us an update on the status in relation to the old Antrim uh, Technical College after the abandonment of a couple of years ago? Well, at this stage, my understanding is that the, the land was, was still in the ownership of, of NRC and is, is, is available um, and, and, and for, for a potential purchase. Apart from that, I'm not sure if I can maybe say much more to, to the member, though I am aware that there are some issues um, around the potential use and uh, some, some different interpretations of what should happen in terms of the local community in Antrim. Clark for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Um, given the untimely pull out of Antrim a couple of years ago and leaving what was an excellent site vacant, um, does the Minister believe that his department is doing enough to fill that void that has been left for post 16 education in Antrim? Well, well certainly we, we, we are very keen to ensure that we have a proper coverage uh, across Northern Ireland in terms of access um, to uh, vocational training and further education. 
Uh, that does not mean that we would have a, a college um, in every particular uh, town, uh, and sadly Antrim is one of those towns where that is not currently uh, the case, that, 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 but that is also replicated elsewhere uh, in Northern Ireland. However, um, there is provision uh, elsewhere, in particular in, in Ballymena, and as part of the emerging uh, business case for Northern Regional College, that is going to be a priority area uh, for investment. Also, we have a very good college in terms of, of, of Newton Abbey. We will look, look to see how we can continue to invest in community-based facilities uh, in Antrim. And if, if the member has any particular concerns in, in that regard, may, may please drop me a line and we'll look at that issue in more detail. Well, Mr Jimmy Spratt for a topical question. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister now that the Executive have reinstated the payment to Stranglinus <coughs> University College? Uh, would the Minister explain the future financial uh, viability of the College, uh, taking into account the 2013 Grant Thorndon report? Well, yes, I mean, the Executive has uh, uh, overturned, uh, regardless of my decision, uh, my proposed decision in relation to uh, the, the Premier. Um, however, we still have a um, teacher training system in Northern Ireland that remains um, financially un unsustainable. And there is a pressing need for reform, but reform doesn't need to, to be just based around uh, uh, finances. We have to look to see how we can ensure we're delivering to world-class standards, how we're addressing equality issues, how we're addressing uh, opportunities to, to teach our, our students within a, a shared uh, le learning environment. So the current system is not delivering on all of those points as far as, as, as it should be. But we have a situation where in particular, the two teacher training colleges are very heavily subsidised, and they're subsidised in, th in three ways. Uh, first of all, we have the premia, and uh, they are the only teacher training colleges in the UK to receive premia payments. Uh, we also have the provision of non-ITE subjects, uh, which is, again was a very conscious decision to give them other business to try to maintain uh, their viability. And thirdly, we have a situation where the Department of Education, in essence, uh, increases the teacher demand model uh, to a level to provide an artificial level of teachers to be trained, again, to, to give the colleges more business uh, ahead of what the local market can sustain. But even with those subsidies, we're in a situation where the, the colleges will gradually have their, their financial sustainability uh, eroding over time. Uh, with the res restoration of the premia, the, their prospects into the future will, 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 will be longer. But we're, we, we can't escape the issues. And the need for reform. Mr Spratt for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, and can I further ask the Minister in terms of uh, his answer, uh, has there been any ongoing discussions with the Board of Governors of Stranmilis University College by his officials? Uh, and indeed, is there still a uh, suggestion of a merger with Queen's University? Um, well, first of all, I, have, I myself have not had a direct meeting uh, with Strand Millis in the intervening uh, couple of weeks since the, the, the executive uh, took that decision. We are, however, continuing to engage uh, with um, other stakeholders um, around the, the future system because the process of reform and seeking consensus on reform has to continue. I have received correspondence from Strand Millis in terms of some of their emerging thinking uh, and, uh, in terms of, of, of the way forward, and indeed my officials uh, are continuing to work with them um, as well. But I do have to say um, to the member, insofar as he's, if he is advocating that we reconsider the potential merger of Queen's and, and Stramillis, that that was something that was very much on the agenda uh, back in 2011. However, his party at that stage were very clear that they were not prepared to contemplate a, a merger of Queen's and Stramillis outside the context of wider reform within the teacher training uh, system. And in the, in the context that I was to move the legislation um, to facilitate the review, that uh, they would have tabled a position of concern uh, to, to, to block that. So, um, if the member and this party are, are reconsidering their position, I'd be very pleased to have a meeting and discuss the, any uh, change of heart in that regard. Call Mr. Datty Mackay for a topical question. Minister, I will be going to an awards ceremony this evening in Port Benome, uh, in which a number of people will be receiving awards through a return uh, to employment programme funded by the ESAF. Now, it looks quite likely uh, that the group that is running that uh, will no longer be in existence if this funding is discontinued. Can I simply ask the Minister why this issue in terms of ESF for those who are actually delivering on the ground is not a priority for you? 
Well, the member is, is very wrong to assume that that is not a, a priority uh, for me. We, we have indeed spent probably more time on this issue over the past number of weeks than, than, uh, than anything else. But to be very clear in the context here, we, we have a situation where, where one round of funding is coming to its natural end, and every group that bids in terms of the current outgoing round was very clear for, in term, of the, terms of the, the duration of, of the funding. Um, I'm not aware of the, the precise context in terms of any fresh bid um, made by the organisation the member has made, but no decisions have been made in terms of any uh, f future funding decisions, and that won't be made until we have the full picture in terms of scrutiny of all of the applications uh, that, that have, been, have been made. Now, we are oversubscribed by 1.8 times the amount of money available, so we will see a, a situation in which some organisations uh, will, will be uh, unsuccessful and no doubt very disappointed. However, Others will continue and receive funding uh, for, for their projects. Now, we are at this stage trying to pull out all of the stops uh, to ensure that we can make decisions on funding uh, before the end of April so that we can ensure a continuation of the work that many organisations are doing. And just to put this in, in context, in, in, lest people accuse us of running very close uh, to, to the deadline, um, we put a lot of focus on actually getting our European Social Fund operational programme cleared by the European Commission. That we achieved that um, back in 2014. Uh, our counterparts in England, for example, have yet to have their operational programme cleared by the European Commission. So we are now in the context where we have the, op the option of ensuring continuity between programmes. In England, that will not be the case, and there will be a break for many organisations, and that will have a devastating impact on staff and also the participants with whom organisations engage. Mr Mackay, for supplementary. Gurum, I get a, a last kind of query, and uh, I'm, I'm not here to talk about people in England. I'm not here to discuss uh, what Europe is doing or not doing. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you can blame Europe all you want, but what we are receiving in terms of the message from the community and voluntary sector is that it is the department uh, that are putting blockages in the way of these groups, and the department is putting down criteria that is resulting in a situation where these groups are, are being put on the line. Uh, so my question to the Minister is, does he recognise that fact? What is he going to do uh, to ensure these groups do not go to the wall? And does he also recognise that the women's sector in particular is going to be decimated by his department's actions? There's probably, there's probably about four or five uh, questions in there. I'll do my best to, uh, to pick them up. Uh, the member says that th this has nothing to do with England, this has nothing to do with Europe. It's very much everything to do with Europe, given this is European money uh, that's coming down, and we have to abide by the rules coming from the European Union. If the member wants to go a UDI on this, uh, then that, that's fine, and we'll have to find the resources locally, which we simply don't have. So let's be sensible about this and use the opportunity that comes from our membership of the European Union uh, to invest and extend what we could. We could we we would otherwise not be able to do in terms of our own available resources here, here in, in, in Northern Ireland. But again, there can't be any particular guarantees made to any organisations. Um, our officials are working tirelessly to ensure that we can have decisions made by, by the end of March. And the reason we make the point around England is the point that, to make the point that actually we are being far more proactive than others in ensuring that, that, that this is the case. If there's any particular issues, for example, with coverage uh, regarding the women's sector, uh, and that may not necessarily be the outworking uh, of, of the final decisions, but if that was to be the case, then there may well be different ways in which we can reassess uh, the distribution of funds to ensure that we do uh, invest in what are the policy objectives of the department and ensure we have a proper coverage, not just geographically, but across the different aspects of engaging with those who are most marginalised from the labour market. I call Mr. Pat Ramsey and Mr. Ramsey, you won't have time for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could, could I ask the Minister, could he outline to the House the key objectives of the ministerial subgroup and, and how they're going to achieve regional balance and a reduction in economic inactivity and joblessness in the North West? Well, um, very briefly, I mean, I can't, I can't answer, answer on behalf of the executive. It's more a question for the first minister and deputy first minister to set out the the, the broad remit uh, and, and rationale uh, for that. Let, suffice to say, I'm happy to play my role. Uh, obviously, the issue around um, the investment in university facilities in, in Derry is a key aspect of that, but also economic inactivity is is, uh, is, is critical. Um, we've been joined by the minister for enterprise, trade, and, and investment, and the member will be pleased to know that we have now formally submitted um, a paper. Uh, 
uh, the final strategy uh, to the executive uh, for, for approval, and I'm sure he will be encouraging his minister uh, to give that strategy its full endorsement whenever it comes up for a discussion at the executive, uh, hopefully this week, but uh, if not, over, the, over the, the rest of this month. Order time is up. Uh, we